Hi, everybody. It's Shigura Shibi, and today we have a very serious topic to talk about. So, if you are uncomfortable by the themes of CSA, SA, or、uh, physical abuse as a whole, please take care of yourself and do not watch. But moving into the main topic of the video is Angel Dust from Has Been Hotel. Before we get into Angel Dust as a whole, we actually need to get into the song Poison, as Poison is actually a catalyst for this video and today's topic as a whole. Poison is the seventh song in Has Been Hotel, debuting officially in the episode Masquerade. Poison is sung by Angel Dust, coming from a buildup of stress and abuse at the hands of his employer Valentino earlier in the episode, and expressing it through music. The lyrics expressly stating that Angel Dust knows that he's in a bad situation. He knows that the situation is slowly killing him. However, he cannot escape, no matter how much he wants to. The song is using the facade of glitz and glam as a cover to express how Angel Dust is covering up his own emotions. His entire situation stemming from an industry built to look pretty, despite the vile that lurks underneath. Living up to the episode's name of Masquerade, the expressly stated issue of Angel Dust. Hiding his abuse and insecurities underneath his sexuality. The song was actually posted a day earlier than the episode on Spotify, which Twitter users were not happy with. The response to the song was an immediate label of fetishizing Angel Dust's abuse. Now, I've heard a lot of different reasonings for why it's fetishized, ranging from it's in a song and dance number to this is not how survivors present themselves. And I want to go into why those reasons. Do not actually hold up in the actual context of the song and Angel's situation. When talking about Angel Dust's situation, we have to take into consideration his environment. Angel's abuse stems from his boss Valentino. Valentino runs a sex work empire with adult films aplenty. But if you know anything about the sex work industry, is that its glitz and glam hides some horrible actions underneath. It's very commonplace that the sex workers are forced into situations that they are not comfortable with, or they are extremely abusive. Quid pro quo harassment is the most common, essentially boiling down to "you do something for me, I'll do something for you." Valentino very obviously uses his place of power over Angel Dust to hurt and abuse Angel, which results in Angel's reward being his fame. Listen, I'm not one to infantilize sex workers. That's just fucking weird. However, sex workers are often taken advantage of in the industry due to how predatory the industry is as a whole. However, even with how predatory the industry can be, that doesn't mean that those in the industry don't enjoy their work. When we talk about predatory industries, we don't mean that the field of work itself is messed up or should be dismantled. We mean that the predatory nature of them should be talked about and forced to be held accountable. Let's take Project Melody as an example. She's in the same line of work as Angel Dust, even doing music projects and shows. But something that other sex workers in the field felt was that Melody got off easy because she doesn't have to show off her actual body, putting her in less danger. However, anyone with A brain cell should be able to know that the validity of a person in their line of work should not be how much danger they face. Instead of pushing for less danger for all of the workers in their field, they instead chose the easy way to blame the person that was giving themselves extra protections in their same field. Now, this isn't actually to blame those sex workers for their feelings on the matter. Their feelings are technically valid. It hurts to be in such a vulnerable and dangerous position, and then see someone who is absolutely not in the same position, but they're doing just as, if not a ten times better. Now we actually have to apply this to Angel Dust. Angel obviously loves his work and takes a lot of pride in it, showing it off at show and tell with a lot of joy present in himself. Angel loves his field, but he also knows that he's in danger and that Valentino is the one killing him through overworking and forcing Angel Dust to perform even when he does not want to. If Angel Dust had control over his career, performed when he wanted to, the same way Project Melody does, he could do exactly what he enjoys, everything he loves, but not be in danger of Valentino or any other sleaze in the industry. But Angel Dust is shown to have sold his soul for his position as the head of Valentino's empire. Angel Dust wants to leave, wants control, but he can't. Another thing we actually need to discuss is how it's kind of, sort of trendy to hate Vizzy Pop. 
listen, I'm not the type of person that throws out any and all allegations because they're against a creator that I enjoy. I've been a part of the Minecraft community since I was a child. I've been through this way too many times to do that. But we genuinely need to go into all of the actual allegations that have been against Vivzy for literal decades at this point that genuinely have no substance or are just people trying to find reasons to hate Vivzy Pop. That will have to be its own video because there are just way too many of them for me to just squeeze it in here. However, I will be going into one of them. I'll be using the very infamous PK Russell for this as he was one of the very first with a a very big platform to go against Vivzy Pop for honestly really fucking dumb reasons. Back in the fall of 2019, PK Russell released a lackluster video trying to go into the faults of Hasbin's pilots. The issue being, he had absolutely no script and throughout the entire video shows that he lacks even the most basic of media analysis such as attributing Angel Dust's entire premise to being sex jokes, not realizing that Angel Dust's sex jokes and references are that they're the setup for another person's reaction. Oh, harder, Daddy. Son. I can suck your dick. Ah, no. Your loss. While this video was very poorly received, especially because it was during the height of Hasbin's popularity, it has started and continued a trend of very poor media analysis disregarding for the actual intent of the characters and leaving out that each episode is a foundation for further development, leading to this becoming the standard for Hasbin's, quote, critics, unquote. Vivzy Pop is not a perfect person, far from it. But if we were to truly go into what everyone seems to have to throw against her, it has to be its own video. Every controversy that I talk about here on out in this video has to do directly with Angel Dust. One of the biggest things that we need to talk about before we can even get into Angel Dust is the fetishist storyboard artist. To begin, I need to talk about the fetish itself, as too many people have shot down this criticism of those going against the artist. The fetish, which deals with the R word, is a common fetish of those that have had trauma dealing with sexuality. You see, a lot of people keep boiling this down to a rape fetish, which in reality, this is called consensual non-consent. What is the first word? I have heard so many people call this artist disgusting, dirty, subhuman, and so many other derogatory terms, but whenever someone points out that it's a commonplace fetish for survivors of sexual trauma, they get shut down with the same exact terms, even if they are survivors themselves. We will be discussing this more in depth later in the video, however, I need to bring this up right now because the artist is a survivor of trauma relating to sexuality. Oh, but then there's the argument of Vivzy Pop called them an SA survivor, but the artists themselves corrected her. Except here's the thing, you can have a trauma relating to your sexuality without being a victim of SA. One of the other things to note here is that many victims of molestation do not consider themselves victims of SA because of the lack of penetration which we see often talked about in fiction. There's an entire episode of Always Sunny where molestation is talked about constantly, resulting in one of the guys being upset because he wasn't molested by the teacher, resulting in him trying to get molested as an adult due to being an egomaniac. I'm not saying one is worse than the other. Both of them are awful things that no one should ever have to go through. But what I am trying to say is people talk about these at very differing levels. So people that are victims of molestation often do not actually consider themselves victims of sexual assault. The artists themselves have confirmed that they are not an SA survivor, yes. However, they have also confirmed that the fetish is a result of trauma he endured in connection to his sexuality. Also, before anyone tries to argue that trauma relating to sexuality and sexual trauma are two different things, yeah, they are. However, a large part of trauma relating to sexuality stems from abusive homes where you are forced to hide any resemblance of sexuality, where you are exploited, or religious environments where any sign of the wrong sexuality can lead to severe punishment. Any and all of these can be sexual trauma or trauma relating to sexuality. 
both results in a mental mess of how you express your sexuality. I mean, do I need to speak about how a lot of individuals who are forced to be in the closet for long periods of their life end up overcompensating after leaving said closet because they have not been able to live life as themselves until now? And furthermore, when you look into the artist and their artwork, you can see that they put themselves in Angel's position. Yeah, all these people saying that this artist is such a horrible person and is a vile human being because he has a rape kink aren't talking about or don't even know that the artist puts themselves in the victim's position. Which, let me remind you, a rape kink is very commonplace in survivors because they can retread their trauma in a safe environment where they have control. The artist very obviously identifies with Angel Dust with not only their hypersexuality, but also being a victim that cannot escape their environment. Hell, even in the artwork that they were making of Angel and Valentino, while I can't find much of it anymore as they have deleted all of their socials because of the harassment that they were facing, has Angel in a very real but also heartbreaking situation of being exploited and yet longing for their abuser. The artist isn't someone that wishes this shit on others. They aren't someone that wants to commit the act. They are someone that has a trauma that developed a potentially dangerous fetish, which they, instead of putting themselves in a dangerous situation, explore safely through art to regain control. Also, for those that say that someone with this fetish shouldn't be allowed to work on this scene, one, storyboards are almost always so heavily changed through the process that any actual fetishization that could have taken place here would be completely gone by the end of the process. And two, when writing and storyboarding a scene like this, wouldn't you want someone that knows how this stuff plays out? Someone that is not only not upset by the material like others may be, meaning that those that cannot interact with the material do not have to, but also someone that knows how to show the horrors of said action and how vile it can be? And three, I feel you need to watch Ponder Sprockets, Your Art Offends My Sensibilities, Stop It, as it delves into why expressing these types of horrors is important and just because you cannot handle the material doesn't make the material itself bad. There is a difference, which we will also be getting into more later. The artist also has the allegations of being a pro shipper, which if you don't know what that means, it means someone that is a-okay with awful things like a child character with an adult character. However, this allegation is also bullshit. This allegation comes from one, the Valentino and Angel Dust ship, and two, this one quote. We've already gone into why condemning the first one is dumb, but this second one is somehow even dumber. See, this post is from June 3rd of 2023, aka before the call-out post started against them. Why is this important? This quote isn't about, oh, let people ship children with adults. It stems from the shipping war that has been going on in the fanbase for literal years, on if Alistair should be shipped with Charlie, Angel, or even at all. This quote isn't some pro-shipping garbage. It says, stop fighting and let people enjoy their small pleasures. And to finish off talking about this artist, let's talk about the allegations that the artist wanted to send a 15-year-old nudes. This is the exact interaction that has started these allegations. I will give you five seconds to figure out why this allegation is complete and utter bullshit. There is no indication of the 15-year-old's age. Hell, their own user contains the word father, indicating that they're an adult. Plus, this isn't an actual offer. It's simply a joke. And on top of all of this, the artist has multiple indications of minors do not interact, and a minor proceeds to interact. Meaning the minor ignored all indication that this person's content is not for them and entered an adult space to complain about the adult content. This is not a valid allegation. This is taking a snarky response and shoveling a whole load of bad faith and villainy onto it and claiming this person gross because fetish and now child, when in all reality, the artist obviously didn't know the person's age. Do you check the bio of every single Twitter user that interacts with you, let alone as someone that's literally trying to harass you? The minor interacted with materials they shouldn't have and received a snarky comment and a sex joke, which, if you remember, this artist heavily relates to angel dust. 
Hell, this could actually be attributed to all of the storyboard artists' work, as Dead Dove Do Not Eat is fully displayed in their bio. People are seeing a warning, indicating that there is stuff that may be triggering and is not for them. Not to mention the fact that the tag literally means that this is fictional and would be absolutely awful in reality. And instead of turning away, they're choosing to not only engage with the content that they do not like, but also condemn it, despite being warned. Also, nothing like trying to paint victims of trauma as being predators. Not like we've been trying to break that stigma for literal years. Thanks, y'all. With that all taken care of, we can get into the proper release of Has Been Hotel. The imagery shown and the story told we see are extremely different than what people have been upset over. Angel Dust sexually harassing Husker? Each time comes after Husker threatens violence against Angel Dust. It's a defense mechanism. Angel Dust being a horrible resident of the hotel? completely disregards that Angel Dust has shown not only to be taking shelter away from Valentino, meaning that he didn't sign up to redeem himself, he did it to hide away from his abuser, but it also completely disregards that Charlie is insensitive to Angel, albeit without her realizing. Angel being a fetishized representation of an SA victim completely disregards all of the things that Angel is outside of being a victim. Angel is hypersexual, loves being a star in his films, knows a lot of how the films function, offers help where he has expertise, and this completely ignores Angel's growth from being at the hotel to keep himself safe to becoming someone that will put himself in danger, even the very danger he's afraid of, to keep the ones he loves safe. Look, she ain't used to this scene. I, I just don't want it to end up in the gutter like I used to. One of the major points that Has Been Hotel puts forward is how certain victims cope, putting themselves into dangerous situations. This can be for a variety of reasons. And this, this is my escape, where I can forget about it all, how much I hate everything. A place where I can get high and not have to think about how much it hurts. And maybe, if I can ruin myself enough in the process, if I end up broken, I won't be his favorite toy anymore. For Angel Dust, it's to try to become broken so that Valentino will let go of him. While in Tuca and Birdie, it's to regain control of what happened to her as a child and how it has affected her sexuality. Yeah, all of the people criticizing Has Been Hotel are criticizing it for aspects that other media have been praised for. Girl with a Dragon Tattoo is a movie that was originally praised for its depiction of how real SA is. But my entire family was so grossed out by the scene, which mind you is one of the first scenes in the entire movie, we had to turn the movie off, which is a very rare thing for my family to do. I completely disassociated from the movie, and by the time I stopped, I found my brother crying, my mom trying to calm him down while also being completely freaked out, and my father so uncomfortable that he was staring at the now blank screen. If you genuinely want to see a fetishization of SA, watch this scene. It lingers on it and accentuates it. It is genuinely gross, but people have praised this movie for literal years. Why stop at visual media, though? Music has plenty of representation of abuse. The song Concrete Angel is about a little girl being abused by her parents. Her teacher sees the bruises but brushes it off. The neighbors hear her screams in the middle of the night, but they ignore it. All leading to the little girl being murdered by her parents because no one stepped in to help the child. If you haven't heard the song, I highly recommend it because it's a beautiful song about horrendous tragedy. But what about musicals? Well, we have Heather's Blue, where Heather has put Veronica into a position to where she's about to be sexually assaulted by two of her classmates. We have All You Wanna Do from Six, where the song goes into how throughout all of Katherine Howard's life, men have been taking advantage of her sexually, even when she was a child. Yet the song wasn't lambasted against for making S.A. look pretty. It was praised and resounded as a heartbreaking retelling of history. And we have Addict from Has Been Hotel. One of the things that people who haven't watched Has Been Hotel aren't going to understand is that any and all songs are essentially a two-parter. Vaggie and Carmine's duet song from episode 3, we get payoff for it in episode 7, as both of the characters' motivations stems from who they love and care for. Carmine's being her children, while Vaggie's is Charlie and her friends. Hell is Forever, from the very first episode, gets a reprise in episode 6 in You Didn't Know, but this doesn't stop with songs from Soul 
bully the show, as Happy Day in Hell from the pilot gets a reprise in Episode 8 to round off the season, and Addict gets poison. Addict was a song released to help promote the official series. The song goes into how Angel Dust had been having self-destructive tendencies for a very long time. However, when Valentino comes into his life, he promises to make Angel Dust a star. Things delve into abuse after Valentino assaults Angel for the first time, resulting in Angel Dust having a breakdown and his feelings of disgust. But Angel had already sold his soul at this point. Angel Dust is addicted to the high of what Valentino had provided, but it turned into something poisonous poisoning angel. Poison delves into continual abuse. When you're in a situation where you cannot leave the abusive party, resulting in disassociation, denial, and a festering of feelings that you cannot control. It really surprised me how much backlash the song Poison received when added to was praised so heavily, but that may be because of how, in media, we tend to talk about one-time assaults more than we do continual assaults. And this severely causes issues because it hurts and harms victims, whether one-time or continual, who relate to these topics. I, myself, am a victim of assault. One of my abusers stems from my childhood, resulting in continual CSA. One from my adulthood, which resulted in a one-time essay. And one from my entire life until I cut them out at 18, resulting in childhood physical abuse. I'm going to get very personal because I want to hammer in why Angel Dust matters. And to do that, I have to really go into why Angel Dust matters to me. In my childhood, there was a boy who would play a game with me. I didn't know what I was truly doing because I was only around the age of seven at the time, but he always wanted to go off and hide with me and play the game. Luckily, the boy was forced to move away and that resulted in the games stopping. But that didn't stop the disgust that built up inside of me throughout the years. I always felt weird about this growing up, but it wasn't until I found out what had actually happened during those times that I started to that I started a phase of denial. It would keep me up at night, but I felt ashamed that it happened, that I let it happen. I felt like I should have known better, that I shouldn't have gotten myself into that situation. Yet I was a child, what was I supposed to do? Why did I blame myself? I kept this all to myself and continued to try to live a normal life. I started therapy at 15 due to my anxiety issues, yet I never felt comfortable enough to talk about the assaults. I had even tried to at certain points, but I could never get the words past my throat. Later, I had my second relationship as an adult at the age of 19. However, during our first time together, I wanted it to stop. I told him as much, and he paused for a moment before continuing without my consent. I had told him I didn't want to, even used a safe word, but he didn't stop. I disassociated, but at the time I came back, he had given up and gone to bed. My denial came back. I couldn't have been assaulted. I was in a relationship with him. We broke up not too long afterwards. It wasn't because of the assault, but he didn't like that we were all both too busy, which was because of the fact that despite my denial of what happened, I had been avoiding him and pretending to be busy. Lastly, I need to go into a lot more information with this last one, as it stemmed from nearly 20 years of my life. My biological father. My mom and him had been divorced since I was about three, but whenever my siblings and I would go to visit him, it was extremely difficult. Oftentimes forced to make our own food, despite the fact that not even a single one of my siblings was a teenager at the time. He'd only ever make or provide dinner as he was working during our short visits despite my mom being under the impression that he was taking the time off to be with us as he only saw us for about a week or two almost once a year. He was a military man but he treated us like we were enlisted, ordering us around and if we as so much as disagreed or spoke out against him, we'd be yelled at. When we were in his house, it felt like we couldn't move, lest we break something. It felt suffocating and as if we were dogs more than his children. We were always told of how expensive feeding us was, yet he always seemed to have the newest consoles and video games. But the worst was when we'd roughhouse. Something that seemed so normal at the time, but it wasn't. Not the way that other families did. He'd be upset with something, whether it was something my siblings and I did or not. We'd roughhouse until one of us kids got hurt. It was often me, as I was the youngest, yet when I cried, I wouldn't be comforted, he would simply leave, knowing what he did, yet not caring about the outcome. 
This continued for years throughout our visits. And the food situation got worse when we started staying with his mother instead of him. But we were used to that. My mom always wondered why we would bring so many snacks with us, but we were too scared to tell her what was actually going on. Not fully understanding how bad everything was, but knowing that it would get him in trouble nonetheless. Over the years, I became jaded and numb to how we were treated, but the moment that stood out the most to me was when I was around 14. We would always be forced to play D&D as a quote-unquote family, with my grandmother, biological father, siblings, aunt, and uncles. This would have been nice if it didn't always result in hours of them shouting at each other, forced to not be able to use the bathroom despite pleas to do so, and forced to stay there for 8 plus hours until 2 to 4 a.m. every single night that we played. At 14, I didn't want to. Everyone was gathered and I was apathetic, not wanting to play. My biological father was sat next to me as I stood near the doorway. Everyone tried encouraging me to play, wanting to get their way, but I refused. I felt drained and I heard the man say, come on, as he shoved me, full force. I'm a small person, 5'2 and petite enough that I have to shop in the kids section. It was even worse back then. So a full grown man, military man, shoving me full force was more than enough to send me across the room. But my flight was stopped by the washing machine that my grandmother had in the room. Stopping me in my tracks was a loud, thunderous boom from the machine as I hit the floor. I was numb. I knew what just happened. I knew my body hurt, but I felt nothing. Everyone there knew what had just happened, yet they did nothing. They just watched in silence, knowing. No one came to my defense or my rescue. No one even got up to try to help me out. Instead, I stood, I stood, tears starting in my eyes, but I didn't say anything. I did nothing. I just stood there. My biological father pulled me into his lap and kept repeating, You know I didn't mean to do that, right? You know that. He never asked if I was okay. He never said sorry. He only wanted to confirm to the others in the room that everything was okay because I, the one that just got hurt by my father, was saying it was okay. I didn't want to. I wanted to say so much more, but I didn't. I held back. I nodded to his repeated question, and to him and all of the other witnesses, everything was okay. But it wasn't. I wasn't. And yet, I didn't say anything. I didn't want to make waves. And I needed to make sure I was still going on the visits to protect my siblings. I continued going, playing nice and hating every moment of it, until my siblings started to understand how messed up our situation was. After that, I cut him off. It wasn't until I was 20 that I really came to terms with everything. Not because of therapy, but because I had a mental breakdown because of it all. It wasn't until I broke down and came to terms with everything that I started talking to people about everything. First, my brother, as he's always been a safe place for me, and my best friend. Then, my mom and stepdad who cried when I told them everything. But why am I telling you all of this? Because I relate to Angel Dust, from the fear Valentino caused him, to the disassociation and denial of what happened to him, and how he knows what's going on is completely fucked up, but he can't escape despite wanting to, to even the feeling of wanting to become broken so that the person will leave you alone. Hell, I even relate to Angel Dust standing up to Valentino to protect Nifty, because the first time I confronted my biological father was to yell at him because he caused my brother to cry. Angel Dust isn't going to be a one-for-one -one relatable person for everyone, especially those that believe that victims cannot be sexual at all because that's how they cope, despite hypersexuality being a common coping mechanism for SA victims due to the feeling of taking back control over themselves. A lot of the backlash for Angel Dust seems to stem from two things. One, people looking for things to hate Vivzy Pop for, and two, young people or victims who haven't fully processed their feelings of what happened 
happened, condemning the show because it makes them uncomfortable, because it hits too close to home, or is triggering for them. Good representation can still be triggering if you aren't in a good mindset, haven't gotten proper help for what happened to you, or even if you have both of those, sometimes a trigger is still a trigger and it falls onto you to make sure that you protect yourself and don't interact with that type of content. I cannot interact with Girl with a Dragon Tattoo because it is triggering for me, but other people still loved that movie. I believe that it fetishized the assault, but others praised it for it. And maybe that's because I am triggered by the content and it isn't something I should be interacting with. Knowing what is and isn't triggering is going to be a rough time. I read a lot of dead dove do not eat content, yet can still find certain things that are triggering for me. Hell, if I'm not in a good mindset, yelling can be a trigger for me when it normally isn't. Watching Poison for the second time wasn't as uncomfortable for me as it was the first time, and that comes down to knowing what's going to happen. It's why the show tells you in a very obvious and large warning that the episode depicts sexual assault, so you know going in what is going to happen, and that if you need to avoid the episode, you can. I find this entire situation insulting, from victims invalidating other victims for being hypersexual, to people blaming the show for even attempting to depict it, and those that simply want something to be angry at. None of you are helping the discussion of SA in this matter. You are simply trying to silence the depictions that don't represent you. But if all representations are the exact same, that's called a stereotype, and I do not believe for one bit that we should turn media representation of sexual assaults into a stereotype. If you don't like it, don't watch. Like I said, you don't know me. Sex ain't the only thing I'm good at.